Good morning, Pastor Dwayne here with my beautiful bride, Cameron, and we just welcome all of our friends and partners and all of our viewers to this program today with Dwayne Miller and Cameron Miller, and we just thank God for you. We thank God for our friends and partners that make this broadcast possible. If you're not a monthly partner, would you please pray and consider of being a blessing to this ministry? This is how we stay on the air is by faith through your giving and your financial support. I can tell you this, there's a lot of great ministries on VTN, a lot of great ministries on all great net Christian networks around America and around the world. But I tell you this, that we try to be on the cutting edge of what God's doing, what God's saying. We bring you teaching like this. We bring you messages that we deliver from the pulpit at the Edge Church in Cabot. I truly believe, and I say this with all humility, that God's saying things through us in this day and hour that a lot of people don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not that there aren't other great ministries out there, but God's given us a gift of being on the cutting edge, revelation of his word and what he's saying in his kingdom mm -hmm. and what he's doing in his kingdom. And to God be the glory for that. So if we're a blessing to you, please consider becoming a blessing to us financially and partnering with us. You can do a one-time gift or you can call that number or go to the website and become a regular monthly partner we thank God for you, and we appreciate all the support that we have. Before we get into today's word on this final shaking, I'm going to have Cameron pray. Ask Holy Spirit for revelation, discernment, understanding, words of knowledge and wisdom. So, sweetie, will you pray for our viewers? Thank you, kind and most gracious Heavenly Father. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that it is sufficient in all things and to cover all things. Thank you, Father, for the ability to have our eyes opened daily to revelation that you have for us in your written word. But, Father, we have to go to that word in order to see it. Father, I encourage the people to get intimate with you, to get close to you, to draw near to you. This is a new season that the body of Christ is entering into. Mm. Not a frightening time, Father. <coughs> Let mm -hmm. not one child of yours feel fear whatsoever yes. the word is true and we stand on that word father yes, just Jesus. as you promised us in psalm 91 a thousand may fall at our side ten thousand at our right hand but what it will not come amen. near amen our amen. dwelling yes, and let Lord. that be our anthem father with regardless of what we see or hear in this natural as things are getting dark and dreary we stand and say it will not come near mm. our dwelling we remain on the plateau. We remain in faith. And we know that you will give us the ability and the strength and the provision and the protection to remain yes, there yes. steady as a light for your kingdom. We give you all the glory for all the revelation that is going to come out of this teaching today. Amen. Amen. You know, I want to encourage you today, if you're watching, I was thinking as Cameron was praying, I was thinking about history and times and seasons and cultures. You know, there are those people out there that would say, the world has never been this evil. That may or may not be true, but I don't personally think that's true because it was so evil when Nimrod was building that tower that God had to confound yes. their language and scatter them yes. all to the four corners of the earth. It was, so, it was so evil when Noah was on the earth that God had to destroy yes. and start all over right. again. Um, we, all here living, have never seen it like this. Right. We've never seen it this evil. That's true. But God has. Yes. God has the ability to reset. Yes. He's done it before. Yes. 
Right. And he's going to do it again. God has the ability to cause things to happen, to cause a culture that seems too far gone to shift back to his word. And, I mean, I personally think in my studies of the Roman Empire that the Roman Empire was as wicked and as evil as, as you could get. Mm -hmm. And yet, in the midst of that evil, wicked darkness, God raised up a man named Saul and and, and, and saved him and filled him with the Holy Ghost and saw birth to church in Rome. And so I tell you, don't lose hope. We, we must not grow weary in well-doing. Yes, things are shaking. Yes, things are dark. Yes, things may look depressing. But I tell you that it, the best is yet to come. You're part of the solution and the answer, not the problem. So be encouraged. Now let's get into this because I want to show you Biblically, what's really happening? What is this all about? There are radical conspiracy theorists out there, and they think that it's all about God um, uh, exposing evil and changing and changing the government of America in some shape or form. And it's all about you know um, the politics, and it's all about evil behaviors and such. But, but here's what I want to show you biblically what's really taking place and what it's all about. Hebrews chapter 11, chapter 12 is a solid narrative. I know we have chapter divisions and verses in our Bible, but not in the Greek language. And it's one flowing thought. When you come, if I backed up all the way to Hebrews chapter 10, and I'm not going to turn there, but I'll just in a summary, I'll just share with you. Here's Paul, and I believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, and I won't get into why it's too, too long. Paul is writing to these Hebrew people who are followers of Yeshua. They are followers of Messiah. All right? And in chapter 10, he says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, but, you know, which is the manner of some, but so much more exhorting each other as you see that day approaching. Why did he tell them that? Well, because they were, had massive division. They were fussing and fighting like a, a, a bunch of Baptists in a church. <clears throat> no offense if you're Baptist. That's just how I grew up, okay? They, they, were, they were not getting along. They were fighting about going back to sacrificing animals and they were fighting about all, just all kinds of stuff. They were not unified. And, and so because of that, they were forsaking the assembling of themselves together. And you have to understand in that culture, they were gathering every day, like in the book of Acts. They gathered daily and from house to house. Uh, learning doctrine, the apostles' doctrine and so forth. So in order to focus them on what's really important. Mm -hmm. He gets into chapter 11 and he says, let me tell you what's really at stake here. It's faith. He said, let me tell you what you should be focusing on. Faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Mm -hmm. He goes on to tell them, without faith it's impossible to please God. You're over here worried about your little doctrines and your little issues and your little personalities and I'm telling you what's at stake in the world is faith. And he says, have you ever considered how you got to this place? All right? And he talks about the fathers of the faith. Mm -hmm. All right? He start, talks about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And he talks about um, on and on and on. You know, uh, years and years ago, I preached on every one of those figures in this chapter, told their story of faith. God's hall of fame. Then he gets down to the end of chapter 11 and he talks about those who did not receive the promise, but instead, by faith, believe for a greater resurrection. And that if they would sow their life in faith, give themselves as martyrs and in a sacrifice and, and as a seed, it would produce a greater harvest in the end. Mm -hmm. And so that God, in the end, would use us and them together as a cloud of witnesses to perfect the end time harvest. Mm -hmm. Now that's a summary. I've been talking about that for two days. So he comes into chapter 12, verse 1, and says, Therefore, and anytime 
Paul especially uses the word therefore, you need to go back and see what it's there therefore. for. Since we are surrounded, not going to be, but he says we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Hmm. Since we are the answer to their prayers and we're the fulfillment of the seeds they sacrificed. Remember, he's talking to people who fuss and fighting over here about things that don't matter. Mm -hmm. Does that sound familiar to the church in America? Right. Fussing and fighting about whether you ordain women or not? Come on, give me a break. People are dying going to hell. We're going to fuss and fight about whether to use a hymnal or sing off the screen on the wall. Or He says, since we are surrounded by this cloud of witnesses who did not receive their promise, but we are their promise, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider Him, Jesus, who endured such hostility from sinners against Himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. For you have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. Paul is giving them a little spiritual spanking. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, grow up. There are more important things here than the things you like and don't like in church. That's right. You know what he's saying to them? He's saying, have faith. You need to have the same faith as those people who didn't receive their promise. You need to have the same faith as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's right. And David. And you need to understand that those Old Testament patriarchs and those prophets, they were walking in a mystery. They didn't get to see the things you're seeing. That's right. The Bible says they would have longed to have known what we know now. Mm-hmm. And so what he's saying is, what's at stake in this last season before Messiah comes is who's going to be walking by faith and who's going to reject it? Are you going to be in faith or out of faith? Mm-hmm. When Jesus always rebuked the disciples, said, oh, if you have little faith, or he talked about this perverse generation that is of little faith. He wasn't talking about the size of their faith. He was talking about the lack of endurance of their faith. Yes. Paul's doing the same thing here. Because he, here, here he's about to tell us things are going to get worse before they get better. And you know why they're going to get worse before they get better? Because God's about to find out who has faith. You and I share our story often on this broadcast, the things we've been through, the losses, the suffering, the the, the things we've endured. Nowhere nearly as bad and sorrowful as these people in Hebrews 11, don't get me wrong. But still, pain's relative. God didn't cause those things. Mm -hmm. But in the midst of those things, He was looking, are you going to be in faith? Mm -hmm. This is the victory that overcomes the world, Mm -hmm. even your faith. And I have to tell you, this lady is a champion of faith. She, she has more faith than any human being I know. And she came into that faith through hard times. Mm-hmm. That's right. I mean, what would have happened in your life if you'd have never, if you could rewind 20 years and you were still walking in that vein, where would you be spiritually as compared to now? There, nowhere near this at all. A believer, yes, but a powerless believer. And so while God doesn't cause tribulation, persecution, loss, suffering, Mm -hmm. we live in a world where it exists. And when we walk through that, the the shaking is to shake everything off of you Mm -hmm. so you can get down to the, the bare minimum. Yes. Are you in faith? Yes. Are you, are you like Job? Are you willing to say, though he slay me, yet I'm going to serve him? Mm-hmm. Are you like Peter? To whom else shall we go? You alone have the words of life. Mm-hmm. All of our eggs, so to speak, are in one basket, and that's Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. He comes through, or we're finished. That's right. But I got good news for you. He always comes through. We have an advantage. We know the end of the story. He wins. So, here Paul says, keep your focus on Jesus. Why? He's already won the victory. He ran his race. He finished his race. He endured the cross, despised the shame, sat down. You know where he's at? He's at the right hand of God. Mm -hmm. 
sitting in the victor's seat. Do you know where you are? You're at the right hand of God, sitting right there with Him, if you're born again. Seated with Him in heavenly places. There you are. What are you worried about? You're not prophesying, preaching, teaching, believing, living your life for victory. We are warring in this battle that we're in from victory. From victory, not to victory. Not for victory, from victory. Mm -hmm. And so Paul, in the midst of this vein that I'm in, is, is saying to them, look, you haven't even shed your blood. Mm -hmm. What's your problem? And then he goes over here in verse 5, and he said, and have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons? My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? For if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. But he, for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness, now know chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Something that is almost never talked about in the modern church today. Those whom the Lord loves, He chastens. Mm -hmm. Now, not like we were raised, um, maybe not you, but I, and, and not my father, but there were preachers of yesteryear who scared you to death that God was going to get you. You know, if you sinned, if you did anything wrong, God was going to get you. And they just built Him up as this mean old tyrant in heaven waiting on you to mess up so He could knock you over the head with a club. That's not God the Father. But I can tell you this, I raised three children, and I loved them. And sometimes they needed correction for their own sake. You know, if you love your son, your daughter, your grandchild, you're not going to let them go play in the middle of the four-lane Highway 167 out here. I mean, you're just not going to do it. You're going to take them away from there and scold them. And if they go back, you're going to go get them, and you're going to put a, a hand on their backside maybe. Because you love them. The only thing God will ever chasten you over is the things that will destroy you. The things that will kill you. The things that will harm you. The Lord loves you and so He chastens you. In this context God's saying to the ecclesia yeah we're going to have some moments in the woodshed. I'm going to expose some things. I'm going to punish And then he is. He is going to. I've had I've had many moments in my life, and I'm telling you, uh, I had a massive moment six eight years ago in my life where God had to chasten me because I was on a path of egotism and pride to the nth degree. And thank God, He loved me enough to bring me back down to earth and to allow me to see the reality of who I was. And that's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful thing. And uh, so the final shaking is God's way right now in the ecclesia of reminding us who we are and whose we are. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's just talk bluntly, all right? Let's just be real. There's a lot of ministries out there and I was one of them. I wasn't nearly as big as some of them. They start out great. And then before you know it, all of a sudden, it might be not just ministries, it might be denomination. Their priorities get all messed up. Right. It becomes all about them. It becomes about their name, their agenda, their purpose. Where's the kingdom of God? God said to me when I was 48 years old, eight years ago, after having three stents put in my heart and almost dying, God said to me, He said, for 30 years you've been building your kingdom. When are you going to build mine? Mm -hmm. 
that, that was not an easy dose to swallow because I thought I'd been building his kingdom. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you that you're going to see in this shaking God chasing some of his leaders to bring us back mm -hmm. to center where Jesus is the priority, where his kingdom is the priority. And um, he goes on in verse number 12, and he says, Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Make straight the paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather heal. Really and truly what he's saying here is in the midst of this shaking, in the midst of this correction, in the midst of what I'm doing to my ecclesia, then what I want you to do is raise your hands in praise and get on your knees in prayer. Humble yourself. Verse 14, pursue peace with all people, holiness without which no one can see the Lord, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up, cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. You know what he's saying here is, he's, again, he's back to the context of this passage. Get over yourself. Quit fighting over things that don't matter. Live at peace with each other. Quit falling short of the grace of God. What does that mean? How much grace has God given you? Extend that same grace to your brothers and sisters. Lest a root of bitterness spring up, and in the midst of all this, it defiles the whole kingdom of God. Now, I'm not going to read this for time's sake. I don't know if I'm going to get finished with this today or not. But in this, in, this, in this passage, in this teaching, let's, let's just talk about where we are for a moment. I was um, talking to our dear friend, Bishop Steve McEwen, years ago, and uh, we're believing for his total, complete restoration physically. Thank you for praying for Bishop McEwen, who's battling and walking in faith and will be healed. Um, but I was, I was talking to him about this passage of Scripture and about this message. And, and he said to me, and I wrote it down, it was so profound. He said, you can have all the passion in the world and know your purpose. But if you don't have perspective, you'll miss the final move of God. Mm. He said, you can have all the passion. That means you can have the right motive. Mm -hmm and be zealous and busy and you can know your purpose in God's kingdom but without proper perspective you'll miss this final move of God I, I meditated on that statement for a long time and in that here's what Holy Spirit showed me passion if it's misplaced is self-serving As a pastor, I've known people, I've pastored people who became very passionate about a ministry God gave them. And before you know it, they're doing it, but they're doing it for their own glory. Mm -hmm. It's self-serving. Right. Look at who I am and look at what God... I, I, had a, I had a guy that I had to lovingly rebuke one time because he got to the point of, you know, Look at me and look at what God's doing through me. And, this, you know, it was all about him. Passion's great, but passion misplaced is self-serving. Right. Purpose is great, but purpose misplaced is self-righteous. A person who has passion and has purpose and it becomes misplaced, it makes them feel, feel like they're better than everybody else. They're self-righteous. You know, can I be honest about it? One of the one of the groups of people in the kingdom, and I'm not criticizing, I'm just giving you a perspective that if they're not careful, their passion and their purpose could get misplaced. That's the person who has the gift of evangelism. A person with the gift of evangelism thinks an intercessor is a waste of time. Well, why are you over here praying about the lost? You ought to be out there knocking on doors and, and handing out tracts and reaching people. Well, 
if an intercessor is not out there praying for an open heaven and praying for receptive soil, the evangelist job is going to be a lot harder. That's true. You know, and maybe the, inter maybe the intercessor is like, well, I don't know why y'all don't come and, and get in here and war and pray and intercede and why you're always out trying to win people. Don't you understand if we don't get an open heaven and a, and a, and a fertile soil, y'all are wasting your time. So you have to understand that passion misplaced is self-serving and purpose misplaced is, makes you feel self-righteous. But proper perspective is Holy Spirit revelation. Mm -hmm. Holy Spirit revelation. I'm not going to try to finish this today because uh, first of all, do you want to add anything to this? I had a thought and it probably does not tie in at all with That's what okay. you're teaching, but the Holy Spirit won't let me release it out of my mind. So maybe he wants it to come out of my mouth. Okay. But you asked me a little further back uh, if I could rewind 20 years and that got my creative juices flowing. And I was thinking about two of what I feel is the most detrimental and deadly doctrines that come out of the religious world. One is you never know what the will of God is. And the other, well, we live in a fallen world. And I know you're saying that you're right, that does not tie in with what we're talking about. But I think that weakens the body of Christ so much. And you were talking about how Brother Winston said that we need to know who we are in Christ. We have to know the position of authority. Mm -hmm. And I think this may be, if, if nothing else, it may not tie into this, but it may be somebody needs to hear that. Mm -hmm. That needs to be debunked. Yeah, and it's a lie. that's not coming from our mouths. Scripture debunks that. The Scripture is clear that, yes, we are, this is a fallen world, yes, but we have dominion in that world. We have authority if we will take it. Mm -hmm. I know time's running short. And also the word says that we are in this world, but not, not of it. And then, yes, we know the will of God. Mm -hmm. The word is full of the will of God. It is his will that we should be in health and prosper. That's all through the word. Amen. So I think that that needs to be cut off. The head of that needs to be cut off. Well, and how that ties in here is that that's one of the things that God's having to chastise his children over is the wrong doctrine, the wrong teaching. Right and wake up to the reality that we must come into a season of prosperity like never before, right. financial prosperity. And you have to know who you are to receive that. And, and, and do the work of the kingdom of God with it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we are out of time, but we're going to come back tomorrow and we're going to pick this up right here. Don't miss it because you're going to see the perspective of the final shaking, I hope, like never before because God is shaking everything that can be shaken so that his kingdom will manifest. We'll see you tomorrow right here on VTN.